and so I forget my, my exact title in the program, but this probably isn't too far off, using molecular network data to seed predictive models of cell systems is what I thought I would, I would talk about today. And you might be wondering, why is there a picture of an iPhone on, on the title slide? And, and the reason is, is because I think not just myself, but a lot of us in this room, if all of these efforts with Transmart and Cytoscape and, and, and other efforts in genomics and bioinformatics are allowed to go to their logical conclusion, we are all building an AI for disease genetics. And um, much like Siri, except that instead of asking Siri, you know, find me a, a nice restaurant in La Jolla tonight, you'll ask Siri, my patient has the following profile of, of variants, maybe some other data types, of course, probably far more than two mutations. Um, and um, from this data that, that uh, you guys host, what phenotypes should I expect of, of this patient? And ultimately, what, what therapy should I, should I give? So that's the goal, I think. Uh, it's a very lofty one at that, um, but, but how do we approach it? And um, so just uh, maybe moving from the 30,000 foot view to 29,000 foot view, uh, another way of looking at this problem is as a genotype to phenotype translation problem that all of us are, are very interested in. And uh, this problem has been often pointed out by lots of speakers. What I'd like to add that maybe hasn't been, been um, advertised much, at least uh, as, I've, as far as I've heard, is the idea of scale. So, so genotype to phenotype is inherently a multi-scale problem, and there's a physical scale involved that really is at the heart of the problem. So if you think about nucleotide variants, and I'm speaking in, in the broad brushstrokes of orders of magnitude, then those are on the order of nanometers. And patient phenotypes are on the order of meters. So we have nine orders of magnitude there that we have to bridge. No wonder direct gene phenotype association, or GWAS, often fails to find the genes underlying a disease, or we suspect only finds a, a small fraction of the variation underlying a disease. It's just too large of a gap in knowledge. Now, what, what my group and I think a, a whole number of groups have been, have been pursuing as a way to fill that gap in knowledge is this idea of network models, that you at least have one big tool or resource that you can put in that gap, and that's, as, as Keith uh, said, pathways and networks, which really raises two questions. Again, now, now maybe we're at the 15,000 foot, foot level. One is, is how do you accrue that network knowledge in the first place? Do you pull it out of, out of literature? Do you, do you run some set of systematic experiments, some combination thereof? What kind of databases do you use to, to, to hold those uh, types of data? So that's question one. And question two is, just assuming all that got accomplished, that we had all of a sudden magically the complete pathway map of cancer and neurological diseases and, and name your favorite disease here, let's assume we actually had that. Now, of course, we're far from that. But if we had that, so what? How indeed would we then use that knowledge or that map to convert patient genotype and other omics uh, data layers you may have collected for that individual to predictions of their phenotype like, like disease diagnosis and response to therapy? So these are two highly significant and challenging questions. And uh, my talk today will, will sort of brush barely on, on both of them. Um, but as you can already see from this slide, um, our sort of target disease uh, uh, is cancer, um, as it is for a lot of people even in this, in this room. Um, and so, so uh, uh, I'll quickly go very theoretical, as you'll see in a second here. But just to keep that theory uh, framed, we are, are, are very interested in both developing these maps for cancer and then using them in the diagnosis and treatment of patients. We talked about this cancer cell map initiative, which aims to do those two things back in this article here in 2015, if you want to look at the sort of position paper that talks about that CCMI initiative. Um, just to quickly advertise work of my collaborator here on this project, so, so Nevin Krogan up at UCSF has been very uh, 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 instrumental in development of technology to map protein-protein interactions, um, which he's now applying systematically to cancer. So the idea here uh, uh, behind this APMSMS, or Affinity Purification Tandem Mass Spectrometry technology, is you tag a favorite protein 
now in cancer, you can, you can prioritize for tagging those proteins that are, whose genes are frequently mutated in projects like the Cancer Genome Atlas and so on and so forth. Uh, having tagged it, you can then express that uh, tag in relevant cell lines and uh, uh, pull down that protein with an antibody along with presumably its interactors and you identify those interactors using mass spectrometry which in a network view would essentially place the the bait that was interrogated originally with the tag at the center of 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 a neighborhood of interactions with that bait now you can look at the mutant form of that protein you can also look at the wild type form of that protein and you can look over different genetic and environmental backgrounds at how that modulates those those networks the other kind of network that in this cancer cell map initiative we're pursuing is the so-called genetic interaction network. And uh, these are so-called uh, synthetic lethal and epistatic interactions between or among genes. So uh, by, by an epistatic interaction or a synthetic lethal, to be clear here if you haven't heard that before, these are not physical connections necessarily between proteins or other molecules. They're functional relationships between pairs of genes such that if I mutate one gene, I don't get a surprising phenotype, but if I mutate the two genes at the same time in combination, then I do get a surprising phenotype. So in the case of synthetic lethality, that's cell death, and that ends up being a very important interaction these days in cancer therapy because, in fact, one can think about the cancer as having made the first perturbation on the system or the first series of mutations. And now the challenge for drug development is to come in with a second perturbation on the system that exclusively or uniquely exploits that first mutation. Um, and so here what J.P. Shin in my lab has, has begun doing is mapping out large synthetic lethal networks across species, starting and anchoring in, in model species like Saccharomyces cerevisiae, where your screening potential and throughput is enormous. And then um, based on the hits you get or the synthetic lethals coming out of that screen, you can then design smaller focused panels in uh, human cell lines, here using combinations of drugs and RNAi. Um, and so what, what JP has done here is, um, is drawn a network where every uh, interaction here has been observed both in yeast and in human HeLa cells. And that's where he, where he was as of this summer. And, and notice these, uh, these interactions are directed because all of them involve uh, tumor suppressor genes connected to druggable targets. And most of these targets on this slide ha have FDA-approved drugs already raising the idea of repurposing for some of these, these uh, patients who mutate the tumor suppressor genes. So the idea here uh, is that if your patient were mutated in, and notice that's the mutated TS gene where the little uh, uh, stem uh, or um, uh, ball is at the end of the stem, um, if your patient's mutated at ING5 in chromatin remodeling, then what this map would suggest, and this is at this point in time not in the clinic, it's just a suggestion, it's a concept, but the map would suggest you should look at, at tubulin as your drug target. And uh, why? Because that combination of, of gene uh, knockdowns, uh, both in yeast and in human cell lines, produces a synthetic lethal effect. Um, and the fact that you have, you know, a billion years of evolution which conserves that synthetic lethal effect is pretty interesting. Now, since that paper, uh, JP has been working with Prashant Mali, uh, whose lab is in bioengineering here and who was one of the original authors of the CRISPR-based approaches uh, when he was a postdoc for George Church. He's now here setting up a lab for the past couple of years. And, uh, and, and his lab and my lab have been working together very actively to try to get these kind of synthetic lethal networks mapped using dual CRISPR-type technology. So again, this isn't really my, my, my talk today, but just wanted to quickly uh, uh, advertise that. Um, uh, and, and this has been actually quite challenging to make a combinatorial CRISPR system work robustly, but we think after about a year and a half of development, we've, we've, we've got it. And you can, you can uh, again, just like with RNAi and drug combinations, you can begin to draw very large networks of synthetic lethals. And here, we're comparing two human cancer cell lines, HeLa cells now, like I showed you before, but now we've, we've brought in a second cell line, A549s, and the remarkable finding here so far, and again, this is all work in progress, of course, but the remarkable finding here so far is that these two networks look very different. That is to say the pairs of gene perturbations that result in cell death for one cell line is like 70% different than the set of gene pairs that uh, when perturbed 
result in cell death than the other. And the way to see that is the conserved ones are the greens. Anything which is not green is private either to HeLa, those are the blues, or private to A549 cells. So that's an interesting finding. Um, one which I, I initially doubted because, you know, anytime you have two data sets filled with noise, the first thing you do is say, oh, they don't overlap. But they were completely noisy, so, so then, of course, they don't overlap. It's just sampling noise uh, independently twice. But what JP was able to do here, um, and maybe at the beginning of the project, we did have some noise in, in, in there. But, but after many iterations of, uh, of, of developing not only the computational analysis, but the CRISPR libraries that Prashant had in hand, we were able to, to, um, to get to reproducible and robust interactions, but then the real the real proof, uh, to me at least, was when JP was able to go into lab now with not just CRISPR follow-ups, but pairs of drugs. Because again, this design is all based on FDA-approved drug targets. Um, you can, uh, or at least, I, I should say, they're not all FDA-approved, but, but they all have small molecules against those. Um, and so you can now sh uh, look at what uh, is your reproducibility coming out of the CRISPR screen for these two cell lines. Those are the hits, those are the non-hits with drug-drug validation, and the answer is 70%. And importantly, you can validate not just the positive hits, but you can also uh, validate the misses. So that is to say, you can fully validate that this caspate CDK9 interaction um, not only uh, is synthetic lethal in HeLa and not in A549. Right? That's, that's the idea. OK, so you've already heard a bit about uh, Cytoscape. And, um, and so certainly, this is the tool that we've long been developing with a, a whole collaborative open source network to, to visualize and, and uh, to a certain extent analyze these networks. But I wanted to also tell you about Index, which, uh, as, you, as you heard uh, from Keith, Dexter Pratt uh, was, was hired into my lab to, to start setting up. And he's done a pretty good job so far of, us f first of all, securing funding for the project. But more importantly, for, for uh, uh, essentially developing Index as a hub for networks and network products um, coming out of the literature. So to be clear what, what Index is and what Index is not, um, so there are already pathway databases, interaction databases like uh, Intact and BioGrid, uh, and so on and so forth. But what there were not is social communities online for capturing the results of analyzing those big interaction data sets. So when labs like mine, and again, I'm one of a uh, thousand labs, I'm guessing, uh, that does a network analysis using, say, uh, a biogrid network or an intact network or a pathway, um, you, you often uh, publish uh, this subnetwork or that subnetwork or that set of uh, uh, edges. And all of these, these, these products of that analysis end up as your figures or in the supplement of your, of your manuscript, but they're essentially caught there at that point. And they never see the light of day in terms of any database. Um, and there's no way to search over them or to access them if you haven't read that particular paper and notice that, oh, supplemental figure 7A.3 has the, the subnetwork of a variant cancer that I was interested in. Let me grab that. So Index was originally developed to capture all of those results of network analysis and to share them with your friends using a social network uh, mechanism. And that is what it does. But I think in the process, it's, it's very nicely tied together a lot of these, these resources. And our latest uh, development that, that uh, Dexter can tell you about is now there's, there's a widget in, this, in Cytoscape called the Network Valet, which directly connects to Index for its, uh, for its content. Formerly, uh, users of Cytoscape, and this was always a big weakness of Cytoscape, had to go off and pre-prepare their network before loading it. Um, or if, if they were using a plugin or an app to get their network, there was a separate app for BioGrid, for Intact, for essentially every database you wanted, and, and it was very, very confusing. Um, so we're hoping to greatly simplify the workflows in, or many of the workflows in Cytoscape with this index uh, resource. And the other, the other nice development that I can tell you about is 
um, with uh, Elsevier now um, and Cytoscape and Index, we are now for eight target Elsevier journals able to show live network diagrams in lieu of sort of static GIF images of those networks. So again, when you publish your, your sub-network of, of diabetes in, in figure seven of your paper, uh, then, then um, the idea is that's captured in, in a database with a DOI, first of all, but secondly, it's a live diagram that you can relay out and move nodes and edges around um, in, in Cytoscape. And so again, that's currently in sort of pilot phase with eight journals, but we hope that that's going to expand a lot more. Okay, so um, I'm 15 minutes in, and believe it or not, that was all an introduction. So I will now take the next half hour to talk about science. Um, and and, and in, a, in a more uh, slightly deeper way than I have just skimmed over a bunch of stuff going on. Okay. And I want to really focus my remarks on, on two challenges that, that we see in, in the network biology field um, that impact how networks will ultimately, we think, be used for interpreting and translating patient data sets. Um, the first challenge is they are not descriptive of cells whatsoever, and this is a problem. Cells don't look like those hairballs in Cytoscape or an index. So what do cells look like? Well, that's a good question. Uh, one easy answer is cells look like the structures. So uh, here it turns out is the same structure two ways. Okay, um, sounds like a menu on a, uh, an item at your fancy restaurant, you know, duck two ways. This is a network two ways. Um, this is the proteasome. Uh, as I downloaded it from PDB 101, okay, it is, if you're not familiar with the proteasome, it's the vacuum cleaner for proteins in the cell. This is the, uh, so this is like a tube on the side in a way, in a way. This is the core of the proteasome in red and orange, and this is the so-called regulatory particle out here on the edges. You can see there's some fold symmetry going on here uh, uh, about a variety of axes. Now here is the same structure. Uh, or the same set of proteins and their interactions. Color coding is the same. So there's the core, there's the regulatory particle. And here we're simply listing all the interaction data that are available in the public databases like BioGrid for, for these, these uh, nodes. You can start to see in the Cytoscape spring embedded layout that in fact you have a little bit higher density over here at the left among these core proteins and a little bit higher density among the regulatory particle proteins. So you can start to see those two big structures. But I just want to point out that even short of somehow drawing the entire 3D structure of this thing, there's already three or so layers of hierarchy or of scale that are, are not apparent here but are here. So you have the proteasome itself. That then splits into a core and a regulatory particle. Each of those has several subunits, and each of those subunits is made up of actually multiple proteins. So it's three or four layers of scale right away. Here maybe you can see one just by the cluster gram or you know, the, the cluster structure suggested by the spring embedded layout. So the point is maybe we could one day go all the way to the structure. That would be a nice goal, wouldn't it, if we could uh, analyze interaction data to get to that. Um, we may do that one day. Uh, this seems like a very, very hard problem. But perhaps a, 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 a easier but still hard problem is just getting at this hierarchy that we see here of, 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 of objects nested inside of other objects nested inside of other objects. And um, the best example of, of, of that hierarchy is, in fact, the Go project. That is to say, the gene ontology project. So lots of people uh, bitch about the Go as, as, as problematic for their process they care about. But we all use it. It's in a sense, you know, I mean, there's, uh, uh, you can look up this, this Nature Genetics article, but it's, you know, it's one of the most highly cited resources, certainly in bioinformatics. Um, and here's what, what the proteasome looks like in the go. There is the core complex. It's a member of the proteasome itself, the prote pro, uh, proteasome complex, which is a member of other structures. Uh, uh, what I would expect to see is, trans uh, is, is uh, is sort of protein turnover, but uh, that's probably not component, but biological process. But nonetheless, you get the idea. And a couple of years ago, we were able to show that you can, you can uh, get to a lot of that hierarchy uh, by direct analysis of, of molecular network data. And how does that work? So, so you already saw in just the Cytoscape view 
you do get this clustering, but it turns out you can write algorithms that continue that clustering and do it agglomeratively to essentially reconstruct the majority of, of Go. Um, now, there's a thousand and one clustering algorithms out there for, for data. So uh, here, what you needed was really two special features of the clustering algorithm. So, so first of all, what's a, what happens if you apply a normal clustering algorithm to, to uh, protein network data or really any kind of omics, omics data? You start by, if these are the genes or proteins down here at the leaves, you start by greedily joining pairs of, of, of genes that are similar in data. So in this case, similar in their patterns of, of interaction. But of course, uh, it could be patterns of co-expression or what have you. Uh, basically, any, any matrix on genes um, and values can be used to construct such a clustergram. And, and, and you continue that greedy merging process until essentially every object has been merged beneath the root. Now, that draws a binary tree. The problem is that's not at all like the structure of cells. So what you need is a clustering algorithm that respects that cluster. What do I mean? Or that, that structure. What do I mean? Well, if a protein complex has three subunits, why would you have to sort of uh, have a bunch of binary joins to get at that? Why not just join them all three at the same time? If they really are equal uh, to each other, they should be equal to each other in data, and you can extract that. And uh, so, so and, and of course, maybe, maybe it's not three, maybe it's 20. So, so one, you should be able to merge simultaneously any number of, of, of genes or uh, objects in the cell to create a higher order object. And two, um, you need to capture this other property of, 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 of cell structure and function, which people call pleiotropy. What's pleiotropy? It's the idea that a gene or, or any component in the cell, higher order than that, can participate in more than one parent process. So if you have a protein complex, it can have multiple pathways in which that, that complex plays a role. And so we need to be able to, to not just uh, have, have one parent of these, of these uh, um, internal structures, but multiple, if that's appropriate in data. Uh, and so when you do that, then in fact, you get a structure, it turns out, that starts to look awfully like the gene ontology. And how do we know? Because we then uh, were able to do a direct one-to-one -one alignment of this, uh, this structure, which I'm going to call the network extracted ontology or a data-driven ontology, versus the literature or manually curated gene ontology. And uh, how that alignment works, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not functional enrichment, which uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't it, it only cares about the local properties of one sort of uh, concept here. What uh, ontology alignment tries to do is establish a one-to-one -one mapping between the terms in one ontology and the terms in another based on the gene sets that are assigned to a term, but also on how well the parents and the children have been found to map to each other. So there's sort of an uh, uh, um, EM-like aspect, if that, if that means anything to you. Um, so having established that alignment, one can then transfer annotation from the literature curated reference over onto your data-driven hierarchy. And what do I mean by that? Well, here, if you get a good alignment score, and that thing was called the ribosome, now you can name that thing the ribosome. It's very similar to when you sequence a new human genome uh, or a, new sp a genome of a new species. The first thing you do is run through uh, with the gene finder, and you find the genes. Initially, those genes do not have English language names. They have systematic names. But then by alignment to a reference database, you start to name genes. Here, it's the same idea. But now that alignment happens not just at the gene level, but all the way up uh, uh, at all scales in between genes and, and cells. Um, you also, however, just like you can have orphan genes that don't align to any, uh, any previous knowledge in the sequence databases, you can have orphan terms. These are terms that don't match to anything in the gene ontology, and that's where your new biology putatively is. So let's see an example. So here is an example where uh, uh, Michael Kramer in my group, uh, who uh, just got his PhD over the summer um, and is now getting an MD, so he's, he's still going to be here for, for quite some time, um, uh, has tried to, to, to uh, reconstruct or, or construct for the first time, I should say, the hierarchy of systems in the cell devoted to this process known as autophagy. So what's autophagy? Autophagy is this uh, a process by which cells recycle their components, not just proteins, but whole organelles. 
Um, it's actually complementary to the proteasomal system that I just uh, sort of uh, touched on briefly. Um, if you simply gather a bunch of data for autophagy, um, from starting from the literature, but then you can start to add your own data, um, and, and here he's wrapping together co-expression, protein-protein interaction, synthetic lethal interaction, like I talked about, and a number of other kinds of interactions. First of all, you can just summarize all the, that evidence as a similarity score between pairs of genes. So red just means there's more evidence and data that these uh, genes are similar, and blue means there's less evidence and data that these genes are similar. If you wanted to see what data types, they've been rolled together here, so you'd have to go backwards and look at, at the data types that cause that thing to be very red. Nonetheless, you can see, like all of us do when we gaze at these heat maps, I, I, I bet many of us in this room are very good at looking at these heat maps, and you can right away see cluster structure. So here's a nice cluster of ATG27 and 10. Here's another one. Oh, but look, ATG10 is part of two clusters, and so is ATG7. So already a standard clustering algorithm would have to make a decision that would confuse you later. I just want to point that out. Oh, and look, all these clusters at one scale are subsumed in a much bigger cluster at a larger scale. So again, if you just used a flat clustering procedure, you'd miss that detail. So why, why do that? Why not just construct the whole hierarchy that, that uh, best describes the data you've collected? And that's what you are looking at over here with this Nexo algorithm. Um, so let's look at one of these genes that, went, that, that had two clusters in which it participated. Here's ATG10. And so over here, there's ATG10, and there's the two clusters. And this bigger cluster is that one here, which subsumes all of these smaller ones. Now the names on these terms come from alignment in a one-to-one -one way against Go. So Go was not used at all to structure this hierarchy. That came entirely from that matrix. However, it was used to name concepts just like you can use a reference genome to name genes. And so here, it turned out that the genes beneath this node looked a lot, maybe they weren't identical, but they looked a lot like what Go calls core machinery of autophagy. So that term name got, got, got mapped over. Uh, these two complexes, that one and that one, end up being this, this, this red color coding here tells me that those were not initially in Go, but a very quick, it, it, it didn't take Mike uh, very long at all to do a quick literature search and find prominent publications from the past five years that, that name those complexes. So Go just hasn't been able to curate those yet, but they were very clearly uh, known complexes. And so we uh, submitted those names to Go, and the editors accepted them almost immediately because there was so much literature that, that supported those, those clusters. Here over here uh, is still an orphan term, 183. So the grouping of 10 and 27 has not been uh, reported before, either in Go or in any literature that, that's out there. And so if you wanted to uh, uh, design a new experiment, that would be a pretty good, good place to start. Um, of course, this is not just uh, pertinent to autophagy, but one can, can uh, uh, construct these hierarchies for the whole cell. And in fact, um, at least in, in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, where you have the most omics and network data of any species, hands down, you can recapitulate about 60% of the go. And, uh, but rather than dwell on this, what I want to do is just actually give you a demo. Um, because we have, uh, it's not, it's, it, it, it's, it's up online. Um, so you can go to nextontology.org, or here's a prototype uh, for the autophagy ontology. Um, this is unpublished, so I'll, I'll just uh, for now go to nextontology.org. But if you, it, it, uh, this is our best attempt at sort of the next generation, say, of, of cytoscape and index that would start to look not just in a flat way at these networks, but in a hierarchical way at these networks. So let's kind of orient ourselves. Keep in mind this thing is um, the, the nodes here, except for the leaves, which are genes, every other node is an internal uh, system of genes. Uh, which might be a protein complex or a biological process or even an organelle. Um, it's a higher order unit. Um, so let's just kind of get oriented here and, uh, just by way of example. So here's a subset of autophagy genes that mapped to late secretory pathway slash vacuolar membrane, which is not surprising for autophagy. Although what was surprising, by the way, is how much of this, we, we, we made a lot of new biological discoveries in terms of the breadth of the secretory pathways that were, were involved. Um, but if we sort of go down here, um, okay, so here's TOR pathways. 
Now, um, and then Tor factors again, into, you know, there's the Tor complex, there's map case signaling. But now if I, here's, here's what I wanted to show you. If I click on any one of these, I can now in a pop-up window, get the underlying network raw data that were the reason why the thing inferred that, that term. So that's what you would look at in Cytoscape, uh, that's Cytoscape JS turns out, uh, uh, if you were to look at the subset of gene, gene interactions beneath Tor pathways. And already your eye might say, well, there's a cluster there and a cluster there, and there's some structure here. Well, that's it. It's factored it for you. So now if I want to sort of explore this thing further, I can click again. Oh, yeah, well, I can see why it formed that cluster. There's like five types of, of interaction evidence between each pair of those genes. That was pretty solid. Um, so, so we think as a sort of environment in which you can explore networks in this hierarchical way that's very akin to how we already think about the gene ontology, um, except that your term definitions now are directly tied to data. Um, we think that this is an exciting uh, platform, but again, it, it's early days for us uh, still, and we'd love, love your feedback. Let me switch back to, to the presentation. And so just to wrap up this part of the talk, and then there's just one more part of the talk uh, after this. Um, let me go back to show you what, what this thing does to the proteasome. So if you recall, the, the, my motivating example was that we could, you know, the pro, this does not look like the proteasome. Um, well, in our ontology uh, models, it still doesn't look like the proteasome, but at least we can start to get at the hierarchy and, we can, re and, and we, we, we can recapitulate everything and go. So here's what it looks like uh, in the ontology that we construct from these data. That's up towards the root of this thing. There's the proteasome itself, and, and recall that every time you see a name, that name appears just because we got a good alignment against Go. That's all it is. It's this, the structure is not from Go. Um, the proteasome factors into a core and a regulatory particle. The core factors into an alpha and beta subunit, and the regulatory particle factors into a base and a lid, in addition to some stuff that isn't in Go. Okay, but that's, that's the, the, the main uh, hierarchy that, that the uh, Go database records for the proteasome. So we think it's uh, more informative in many cases to look at these hierarchies than to try to gaze at, at these hairballs. Now, um, what, what this allows us to do then is propose a sort of uh, new systems biology framework um, for how you might develop these hierarchical models or ontologies in a sort of systems biology iterative way. Um, so what do I mean by that? Here's this, what people often call the sort of systems biology cycle between experimental measurement uh, and uh, modeling and back to experimental measurement. So you can take all the omics data you have in the public domain initially, build one of these first gene-gene uh, similarity matrices, and then um, cluster that hierarchically. You can start to name concepts in that hierarchy by alignment against the reference database, in this case, Go, although it doesn't have to be Go. Um, and so now, let me close the loop. So now how might I use that, that hierarchy to go back and gather more experimental data? Um, that's what the whole autophagy thing looks like, by the way. So how do, I, how do I execute that step? We think there's a lot of work to be done uh, still here, but I'll show you one interesting observation that, 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 that Mike Kramer has made. So because we've put everything in the kitchen sink into, uh, from, from the public, into these hierarchies, we can now go back through data type by data type and ask what was the most informative data type if the goal is to build Go. Now maybe you don't care about Go, maybe you don't believe in the Go hierarchy, in which case this isn't going to be convincing to you, but if you agree that, okay, Go is at least a bronze standard for the kind of things we'd like to be constructing, then you can ask how well different data types let you do that. And just showing you three of the many data types which, which one can put in, uh, genetic interactions, protein-protein interactions, and co-expression. Why, why these three? Because a lot of people are interested in, in, in these three. Um, these three all have high throughput factories behind them in many different labs, so they're of interest. Um, this y-axis is essentially, so performance here is just measured by how close you come to your best ability to construct Go. So this is how good it gets. This ends up being about, you know, um, uh, as I said, in Saccharomyces, you're about 60% uh, capturing Go and we'll just call that a 1.0 uh, here. So now as I take out different studies 
of either genetic interactions or protein interactions, I do see a decrease in your ability to reconstruct Go. What's interesting is you can remove every genetic uh, 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 gene co-expression assay under the sun. This is for yeast. And you do not impact your ability to reconstruct Go. Meaning all the somehow all the information in these co-expression data is captured in other data types like genetic and protein-protein interactions. And it's not, it's not the reverse. So if you, if you take out protein-protein interactions or genetic interactions, even though you have all this co-expression data in there, you still uh, uh, do worse in your ability to, to reconstruct Go, the Go hierarchy. So based on that, we've gone into our experimental lab, and now we can generate, now this closes the loop on that systems biology cycle, we can now generate a bunch more of the data type that was, was better performing. We could have chosen either protein-protein or genetic interactions. Um, here we, we, we make the argument that the slope on this line is a little bit greater for genetic interactions. That's the way we went. It had as much to do with the fact that my lab already has a pipeline for, for one of the data types and not the others. Um, so so uh, we, we generated a bunch of genetic interaction profiles over a bunch of different conditions. And here the target pathway was autophagy. And so we wanted conditions that stimulate that, namely starvation and rapamycin. Of course, we also looked at the untreated uh, uh, network. And uh, what's interesting is here's again uh, how well you do. This is another way of measuring your ability to capture Go. I, uh, please forgive me, it's not exactly the same measure I was using before, but higher is better. Um, here is all previous data sets. Here is just those genetic interactions. If you just take that new data and construct the hierarchy, you better capture autophagy, at least as it is represented in Go, than all previous data. So that's just showing the value of a single targeted data set for exploring new territory in biology. And of course, you can do best of all if you combine your new data of this screen with the old data, and that, that even better recapitulates Go. And here's some controls just to show if I, sh if I shuffle my, my screen, then I, then I have no ability to re reconstruct Go. So that's reassuring. So um, where, where do we think all of this is going? Um, the, the upshot is, that we think these hairballs are just too close to the data. Um, it's not unlike trying to look at these x-ray diffraction images, which ultimately can be stacked together and processed by advanced uh, bioinformatics, which we now call structural proteomics, to build these structures. Um, you can, and people do, look at these images, but it's preferable to look at these structures. It's certainly much more insightful. Same thing, we believe, is the case for, for these hairballs. You can get insights from them, but we think we shouldn't stop there, and there's going to have to be a lot more processing, ultimately towards a, a full model of a cell or, or, or of, of groups of cells and tissues. Um, and maybe one day you can get even further than this, but so far we, we can at least get as far as, as the go um, as, as a target model of the cell. So now you might be thinking, and this is the last sort of section of my talk, um, now you might be thinking that, that, well, is Go really a model of the cell, or to, you know, to what extent are these hierarchies really models of cells? Um, and there's a big component missing, prediction. Go is, is it, you know, people might have argued that Go is used in different ways, but Go by most of us is used in a purely descriptive way not a predictive way, um, or a way uh, 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 that, that it all would relate to translation of, 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 say, genotype to phenotype, which really is the ultimate prediction problem. Um, but there was, there was a glimmer of an idea for how you, you might do this, and that gets back to why I showed the iPhone at the beginning of my talk. So first of all, just to remind us, here's, here's an ontology. We can now start to construct the structure of these things from data. Um, but, but predictively, it's unclear where that, where that goes. Interestingly, um, and this, this was really just an inspiration for us, I don't know if this is still how Siri really works, but the last academic publication the Siri people had before they got bought by Apple is this one. And if you read this paper, you see a figure, we've, we've actually reduced this figure uh, here, but this is a part of, the, of, of a much bigger ontology that, that, that Siri has for event management. Now, of course, Siri, Siri has a bunch of different ontologies, um, not just for scheduling and event management. Um, and uh, what's interesting is, here's the key advance or difference between 
uh, the ontologies used for Siri and the Go, or, or the data-driven ones I just showed you for that matter. And that's that state is associated with terms in those ontologies. So when I say, Siri, find me a good sushi restaurant for two in La Jolla tonight, which you may choose to do after my talk, um, um, it'll send you, you'll have to go a ways. If, uh, so hopefully you brought a car. Um, uh, there's a whole stack of ontologies in this thing that uh, uh, are being evaluated for the probability or their, li or their, sort of their, their likelihood for matching um, the words you just said. So the words you said are slotted in in their most uh, probabilistically favorable way into each of these ontologies, and this is the one that won. And the idea of these authors uh, that they argue in this paper, uh, uh, and I think it, it was really indicative of a whole field, not just these authors, to be fair, uh, is, is this may be how your mind works as you interpret my speech. You're not just doing the elemental signal processing on my speech, but you're actually trying to work those words as states into your knowledge framework, which is why you can anticipate what my next word may be. Signal processing can't, can't address that. You have a knowledge structure that has to address that. And in the same token, uh, uh, Siri can start in making simple inferences like, what's, so, so, so she now knows what state I'm in and what zip code I'm in. That's, that's unambiguous. But, but ultimately what happens here is, uh, is that these states can get propagated up the hierarchy to eventually return a list of restaurants matching your query. And that list is actually the state of event. That's how it works, okay? at least back in, 20, in 2006. Now, can we, how, how might this idea work for data translation in, in biomedicine? And uh, again, we're not there yet, but we're, we're still playing around in yeast, and we have something that we think is kind of neat. So here's, here's our best attempt at a similar system for genotype to phenotype translation, or prediction of genotype, uh, phenotype from genotype working in Saccharomyces. This is the ontology. It's turned upside down here, so the genes are here. And then here are like small protein complexes and, and reactions. And here are larger protein complexes and pathways and organelles and so on up towards the root. So how do we add state to this? Well, um, if you have a genotype, which is a list uh, in, 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 um, in model organism genetics, genotypes are often simpler than we have in human disease. They're just a list of, of, of mutated or deleted genes. And in fact, if you're interested in um, a, 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 a nice uh, proving ground for, for not only our technology, but any genotype to phenotype prediction technology, um, I would make a note that yeast has by far the largest number of genotype phenotype pairs of any, any resource. And in fact, I need to update this because Costanzo Science now has a 2016. They just updated this yet again. This is uh, Charlie Boone and Brenda Andrews group in Toronto uh, who measure many, many, many gene deletion pairs in yeast and the resulting growth rates. Um, even as of 2010, they covered about 5 million different pairwise gene deletions in, in yeast and their corresponding growth rates. And that's in this publication. Now, now if, if you think about how many gene pairs are in yeast, there's about 18 million. And now this 5 million, is about 18 million if you look in the, in the recent science paper from those guys. So I don't know. I mean, certainly we don't have any, anywhere close to even 5 million human genotype, phenotype pairs in any study, not even close. So, so this is a very nice uh, test set, uh, whether you like my approach or not if you're interested in thinking about genotype to phenotype translation. Um, so so uh, what is, what, but with the caveat that these are very simple genotypes, it's just two genes deleted at a time or one gene deleted at a time, or in some cases, three genes deleted at a time. Um, and so, so uh, nonetheless, how, how did we make it work? So the idea is that's the genotype. You can mark the deleted genes, and you want to predict growth rate over here. So what we do is we first define using the ontology states on each term collectively uh, or, or which collectively we call ontotype. So what's ontotype? Whereas genotype is the set of states on all genes in the organism, ontotype is the set of states on all biological concepts, including genes at one end of the hierarchy and moving up in the hierarchy to higher order concepts. Now the question is how do you decide what the state of a concept is, like a protein complex, 
given the states of the genes. And we used, uh, there, there's, there's lots of more research, I think, that clearly needs to be done. What worked best for us, and we just tried a couple of really simple policies, was just uh, summing the total number of gene deletions uh, that, uh, that affect you. So any gene beneath T5 here, which would be A through E, um, if deleted would add or subtract, if we're, if we're hurting its function, would, would subtract a 1 from T5. So this would be uh, two genes deleted beneath two T5 would be a minus 2. And uh, having then uh, uh, inferred those uh, states, one then notices that different genotypes can now lead to the same ontotype because gene perturbations or mutations coalesce at higher order uh, concepts. And this is going to be the key concept that makes this thing really work um, and is, I think, going to also be very applicable to human disease. The problem we have in human disease is rare mutations. However, rare mutations coalesce and become common hits on higher order processes. There may be just one way to mutate this nucleotide, but there's a thousand ways to mutate the gene that nucleotide's in, and a thousand again fold as many ways to mutate that protein complex or that organelle or what have you. So it turns out then by simply associating, um, doing the gene associate or the, the, the sort of association study not with the gene states, but with the term states or the ontotype, one can get very accurate predictions of at least growth in this case. And um, in interest of time, I'm going to try to wrap up, but just show you that, that, that here, you know, th this is one way to look at the predicted interaction score. Of it. This is actually quite similar to growth. And this is the measured growth. So that's, that's the correlation uh, that the model achieves with the measured uh, uh, observations looked at in one way. If you prefer, you can look at a precision recall curve. But let me focus your attention here, um, which is, uh, I think, uh, uh, bringing to light the main thing that is going on. And that is really all about the hierarchy. So here's, here's uh, if I just take the correlation of predicted and measured growth, that's the correlation if I use the Go hierarchy. That's the correlation if I use um, that data-driven hierarchy I showed you uh, about 20 minutes ago. They work about the same. Go actually does a little better. If that, I don't know if that's significant. If you randomize the ontology, your predictive ability goes as almost to zero. So that's a nice control. But then here are a bunch of, pre uh, of, of previous genotype to phenotype translation approaches that had been applied to yeast. And they're all non-hierarchical, actually these three. They all perform about the same, just a little bit above a 0.1 score here. And here they're like literally that on the precision recall curve. Okay. And even we, we get the same low performance, even if we just take the Go hierarchy and flatten it. So there's, there's something called a gene-gene semantic similarity you can draw between any, any pair of, of yeast genes um, that just looks at how, how close those two genes are together in, in, in your gene ontology. And that essentially draws a flat network from that ontology. And it turns out if you do that, this is, this is the closest sort of flat network to that hierarchy, your predictive power goes uh, takes a big hit. So we, we think there really is something uh, quite uh, fundamental about, about hierarchies as a way of aggregating genetic variants up, up towards phenotype. And so, you know, sort of in conclusion, the, the goal here would be really, um, um, you know, so, so, so I, I, I should say, in my own lab, I've really, as you can tell, bought into this, I, this hierarchy idea. And so, so the goal now uh, for, for diseases like cancer, and back to the Cancer Cell Map Initiative, is really to get at this hierarchy uh, two ways, in terms of first structure and then function. So structurally, we think we know how to start building these hierarchies from network and omics data in the systems biology kind of framework where you can continually improve that structure of the hierarchy uh, against the gold standard by, by performing more and more experiments, and it kind of helps guide what experiments are the most helpful. But then two, um, as you have these hierarchies in whatever state they're in, we think they're going to be a killer tool, sort of the killer app of these hierarchies, is going to be aggregation of mutations in genotype up towards um, disease phenotypes. And, and the idea, in retrospect, is really quite, quite simple. Uh, individual nucleotides get mutated, and those effects rain down on this hierarchical structure that we call a cell. And, and first, those, those effects are felt at the gene level, and then, but then up from there, at the protein complex level, and the pathway level, and the organelle level, 
um, the cell tissue level and ultimately the patient level. So, so I think um, you know, we certainly um, are going to have our hands full in the next couple of years trying to make the system work. Um, in yeast, I've got a result for you. In humans, it is all talk and speculation, but, but hopefully you can see the vision. Um, you know, so you have physical uh, interrogation of that hierarchy, given that physical structure, learning, learning its functionality uh, for how it, it converts mutations at one end uh, to phenotypes at, at the other. So with that, uh, it's been about an hour, uh, maybe a little less. So I will, uh, I will thank you for your attention and uh, happy to take uh, questions. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm sorry. No, in, in fact, we've so so. It's, there's a couple things. So, so I, I did point out how we had um, submitted these those two terms I showed you to the Go, and and so we so it is a way of adding terms to the Go. So these are like protein complexes that weren't in the Go. Oh, I see. I, uh, so, so uh, in fact, the autophagy project is completely disconnected from that work I showed you. That was uh, the autophagy stuff is all is all. Um, um, it, it's a submitted work. It's not. It's not a published work. Right. Whereas the the functionalization of that um, for predicting growth from genotype was published last April or uh, May in Cell Systems, and so just because of the timing of things. That cell systems paper didn't have privy to our autophagy network, so th so when I talk about a data a data constructed ontology for the predictive work, it's based on previous data in the in the in the public domain, not any data I generated for autophagy. It's just a, I mean yes, we, we want to go there. I just don't have that that result. Um, but in terms of 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 so, so I see this wasn't exactly your question, but just to make sure that, that I was clear, in terms of the structure of autophagy, in, in fact, if, 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 if I really asked directly what, what has been learned, only about 25% of that, of that part of, so, so overall we get about 60% of go overlap. In autophagy, it's low. It's about 25%. So you have 75% of, of, of your uh, new terms in your, in your data-driven ontology that aren't in go. Now, if you look at those, a significant fraction of those, I would say like another 30%, are, I have a pie chart from this with exact numbers somewhere, but I'm, it's about 30%, um, should be in Go because they're in literature, but they're not yet in Go. Okay? So, so then the question is, okay, well, what's really novel? And the answer is about half. So we think the, sort of there's a low-hanging fruit structurally of just getting all the literature, pointing, pointing Go editors to the literature they should be curating. But then after that, there's going to be the much slower slog of now what about the half terms that remain where there's nothing in Go and there's nothing in, in the literature. Yeah, I know. I know. I have no idea. Um, I mean, I have some ideas, but I, I don't know if they'll, if they'll work or if there are better ideas. Uh, so, so you're talking about the fact that, you know, here in yeast, I've disrupted the, the gene by complete deletion. And, and as soon as you're into human disease, it's not so easy. And some will increase. So, so that, that I can actually model in yeast because there's actually overexpression libraries as well. So that might be, uh, in terms of taking careful steps here, maybe <clears throat> certainly a next project that should be done, see if someone gets excited about it, is, 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 over, is, is, is the same exact thing with overexpression in yeast. And that's very feasible. And there you'd have, you could explore different functions for how you, you treat that. Um, but then ultimately, you're going to have you know point mutations that have, um, you, you know, I mean, you you could run polyfin. In fact, in, in other work, this also, you know, it, it's a bit speculative. 
tools like Polyfin, which, which try to take a mutation and actually score um, how likely that mutation is to, to be deleterious or the fun, you know, they, 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 they try to sort of functionalize it. We've, we've not found they work any better than just flagging mutations as ones and non-mutations as zeros in our, in our hands. I'm not, I'm not ready to give up yet, but anyway, I, I, I think that's, that's the million dollar question that you raise. Right, with, with, with the scope, just to be careful, that, that it, for, if your goal is to reconstruct the Go part, the, the, the part of Go labeled autophagy. So that's my next question. Right. Look at that in other biological systems, in yeast or in other organisms? Yeah, so actually, so we looked um, as part of um, uh, one thing the reviewers wanted for this work is they wanted to try this in human autophagy. And um, that's, that really wasn't the, I mean, that's another study, cool. but we did briefly look at it. and. Um, and their co-expression um, is more important. One, it, it, it is, that result is not necessarily discrepant with the yeast result, however, because in humans you have much less protein-protein and genetic interactions. Um, and, and, and one wonders how you might even compare the amount of gene expression information for humans versus yeast. So, it's, so, so it is a data point, though. So in human autophagy, co-expression is quite important. But there's a very different blend of data available. Question over here, please. Oh. Yes. Um, I liked your last paper. I was wondering how you quantify the species at a below mix output or how that would be low. Yeah, so, so what we did is we um, only had access to, I, I think I get your question, but you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So, so um, we only gave ourselves knowledge of, and only had knowledge, really, of genotype and phenotype. That's what this data set is. Um, although, again, please do look at the 2016 paper if you're interested in, in an up-to-date data set. Um, and so for our ontotype of term five, we simply look at the total number of deleted genes uh, that, that, uh, whose products participate in some way in that term. That is to say, are beneath that term in the GO structure or in the ontology structure. And we just counted it. So term five is a minus two here if you've deleted B and D. So that's how we assign the state. Now maybe what you're getting into is why would you necessarily uh, infer the state from the genetics? What if you had, a, I, mean, there, I mean, if you think about phenotypes, there are molecular phenotypes associated with every protein complex um, and, and, and you know, uh, intermediate cell, cell structure. Um, and right, structure mirrors function, we believe, in biology. So every structure in a cell at any point in the hierarchy has a set of assays one, one could do. They might be metabolomic assays. They might be uh, phosphorylation to look at the activity of, uh, you know. And so, so I think what you're raising is even another dimension to this problem, which, is, uh, which, which maybe starts to kind of um, provide clues as to how you would, you would integrate in this framework other omics layers besides genotype and clinical phenotype. So, so th that was sort of a long-winded way of saying, I, I, I have no idea how to do what you want to do, but I think it's the right direction. So regarding genotype-phenotype relationship, I really suspect many interesting problems are not easily mapped between the two. You know, the, 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 the data set is noisy. Maybe system itself is very you know, the, noisy. Now your decision tree might be you know, the improved with, for example, including uncertainty between a random voice like a voice. Do you think you, know, you need to think about those directions? Yeah, so in, in fact, we, did use, we actually did use a random forest. This is just one tree in, in the random forest. But I think, but actually, I, I'll tell you what we're trying now, which is, so for this paper, you'll find if you read, the, it's a random forest regression algorithm that, that, that learns how to translate onto. So, so genotype to ontotype, we have a very simple policy here that I just described to, to case of just summation. Ontotype to phenotype, we just used a standard machine learning package with random forest regression. Um, Case. You know, the 
even the data set, even though I mean, if there's no relationship between geno and, you know, genotype and phenotype, you want to just make sure you, you don't find it, <laughs> right? But, but in this case, there was, and you, and, you, know, and you found it. I, I think we're interested, I, I think it's a safe statement that we're interested in cases where genotype does, does influence phenotype. Now, another, this also raises another direction here, which is I've said nothing about environment. Um, and so, so it, it, I, but I think it's, it's still interesting to think how would one get environment into one. I mean, does the, how does the gene ontology deal with environment? They define a term, protein complex A under stress, right? That can't be the right solution to this. So anyway, yeah. So you started talking about scale and the, the nine orders of magnitude. How big is the gap now or asked another way? Yeah. I, I do, I, I accept, I don't, uh, I don't know how to get the data, you know, that, that you would need to do that. So, so let's talk about how big, so if you really, you know, let, let's assume that everything I've advertised here is a reality, right? And, and I think the, the, the reality is there's a lot more work that has to be done to make all this work. I think it's very promising, but we, I think we're going to be in the trenches for quite some time um, just in, in, in really shoring up everything I've shown here. But let's say we do that. So now, what's the scale of a cell? It's like 100 microns, 10 to 100 microns. So now, if you think about this thing, again, nu nucleotides are even up here. Those are, are nanometers, say. And then genes, who knows how to scale those. But by the time you're to protein complexes, you know, you're in hundreds of nanometers. And then by the time you're at cells, you're in, you're in microns to hundreds of microns, depending on whether you're in E. coli or, or a macrophage. Um, so that's, that's how many orders of magnitude there. That's, that's at least four or five orders of magnitude. But, but then to get from there to a patient, we have another, say, three to four orders of magnitude. And again, the go stops at the cell, if you think about it. The, the root of the go really is most closely aligned with the cell. But um, certainly there are those folks trying to construct, and maybe there's some of those folks are in this room, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, the ontology above that level. And I think um, I, I would be optimistic that the hammer I presented here, we could apply for, for structuring those ontologies if we had, but then the question is, well, what data do you, do you need? Um, you, you, should it be single cell data of some sort within a tissue? Anyway, I, I, I have no business um, making any remarks other than I'm interested. Keith. Yeah, and, and, and it's all cell, I mean, it's all cell types, or at least, you know, I, I forget what the resolution is of those maps, but it's at least brain region resolved. Um, absolutely. Okay, well, maybe one more, one last question. Right. And like here, you've got all these genotypes. If your only phenotype is growth rate, you've got a big scale issue because the data is quantity. So I imagine here on growth, you probably would go under very different trigger conditions, uh, other types of conditions, and get a complex. And well, yeah, so it turns out that this, this particular data set controls for your environment quite nicely. But, but one, you know, um, I, I, I think maybe what you're getting at here is how complex is the phenotype. And growth is definitely a very complex phenotype, probably akin to human height, or if not worse. Um, cancer is going to certainly be a very complex phenotype. But there were certainly, I mean, certainly Mendelian diseases would be a less complex phenotype by definition. And maybe back, back to Case's idea, we really should think about those, those, um, those types of phenotypes really as mapping more back to the gene level. It's really, they really are not a problem of scale because they're really a direct readout of that activity of a gene if you really want to think about it. I mean, another, another thing that we're actually working on with Nathan Price, we just got some money to build a data translator with ISB. We haven't talked about any, any of, of the Allen, Allen Brain Atlas stuff. But, um, but, but, but so with, with the ISB, um, uh, they have uh, begun to collect, as, as have a number of, 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 of so, so you might be aware that ISB is now merged with um, 
what medical system up there. Uh, sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, anyway, they're now essentially inside of a, of, 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 of a hospital. And um, um, they're now not only profiling patients at the genetic and, 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 and transcriptomic or and metabolomic layer, they're also developing rich deep phenotyping data sets where the patients are seen every, um, you know, every few months with hundreds of parameters measured each time. And our, our thought would be you could start to structure those, call them symptoms, symptom data sets hierarchically as well in a, in, in a way that might then clarify your question. So you could say, well, here, really, when you say a phenotype, Really, it's a whole cluster of, of, of syndromes or symptoms, and, and here's that tree. Anyway, so, so I think there's, there's room to explore there as well. Okay, well, thank you again. Yeah. Very good. Can you stick around a little bit? Yeah.